Hello. This morning we're going to take a look at the second condition in order to have static equilibrium. Remember the first condition is that the sum of the force equals zero or translational equilibrium means that the object is not moving from place to place. The second condition is all about rotational equilibrium in which the sum of the torques must add up to zero to keep an object from rotating. In other words, the sum of the torques have to be equal to zero. A better way of writing this, or another way of writing this, is saying that the sum of the torques in a counterclockwise direction have to equal the sum of the torques in a clockwise direction. Now, this is the whole basis of solving problems for rotational equilibrium. What I want to do is show you about four different types of problems that can be solved this way. All of them will involve this whole idea of sum of the torques is equal to zero. Now the first type of problem are relatively simple problems. You can call this simple plank, beam problems, teeter taller problems, whatever you want to call them along the way. But basically if you have a simple beam like this with a pivot point at one point in here and then you're going to be asked to solve a problem along this way. In this case, we have a pivot point here. There's your pivot point there, all set up, ready to go on here. We have a mass of 67 kilograms generating a downward force at a distance of 1.5 m from the pivot point. And we want to know what force that you have to put at this end in here to keep this in equilibrium. But one more important thing that you can't forget about, the beam itself has a mass, and it's going to generate its own force at the center of the beam's mass. Now that's critical. A lot of students forget this, and of course the problem doesn't work out for them. The best way to start to solve these problems always is to draw a free body diagram of the situation and include all the forces that are acting on this thing here. So here's my beam, there's my fulcrum, now I'm going to add the forces in. Now if you look at the diagram in here, there's of course this guy, it's going to act straight down, like that, oops, get rid of that one, I always have a problem doing this, straight down like that, in like that, and label what this force is, this will be the mass there, so this is going to be 67 kilograms times 9.8, that'll be that force, and the lever arm length there will be 1.5 meters from there to there, as well as that, there is the beam itself. Now the beam will be center of mass. Now if you go back to the question, it says that the beam is 3 meters long. So at 1.5 meters from one end, 1.5 meters from that end, in the very center there, there's going to be another force acting straight down, like that. It'll be the mass of the beam, which is 7.5 kilograms. So this will be 7.5 times 9.8 and you can see the distance between the pivot and this guy here is going to be 0.5 meters. You can convince yourself of that if you like to. The final force acting on that is the force at the end here, the unknown force that acts at the end in the down direction like this, and this will be simply the force that we're trying to find. Now this is the setup that we have to have in order to be able to solve this problem. Once we have this, we can take a look at the torques, and then we can solve the problem that way. Now the distance that this force is from the end, again from the problem, this thing here is going to be 1.0 meters distance from that end. We know everything. So now we make the statement that the sum of the torques must be equal to zero. That has to be true if we keep moving. That means the torque counterclockwise must be equal to the torque clockwise. At this point, you're probably trying to figure out which is counterclockwise which is clockwise torque. So let me draw a minute. This guy here will generate get rid of that color. Let's put it in here. This guy will generate a clockwise torque. This guy will also generate a clockwise torque. And the other one here, this will generate a counterclockwise torque. You can see it, you can try, you can be a pencil, whatever you want in here. All right. So that means that if I do this correctly, my counterclockwise torque will be equal to force 
times lever arm length. You look at that, that would be 1.0 meters. And that's going to equal this guy, which is 7.5 times 9.8 times 0.5 plus 67 times 9.8 times this lever arm length of 1.5. Now, if you look at that, the only unknown this whole thing is the F force right in there. So what you then have to do is do the arithmetic, and it should work out for you quite well. So force times 1.0 is equal to, multiply all this out, you should get 36.75 newton meters. Multiply that out, you're going to get 98.4.9 newton meters. That so this would be force times 1.0. Add those two together. I believe you're going to get 1, 0, um, 2.65. Sorry, there's a 1 in there. And then you take the force by taking 1, 0, 2, 1, 6, 5. That's going to have to divide it by 1. That means that the force is going to be 1, 0, 2, 0 to 3, 6 figs, newtons of force. And that will be the force that keeps this at rotational curvature. I'm going to stop this.